come and join with us and let everyone tell your words here today, Lord. And we ask you to bless the pastor as he brings us your message and bless that for Lord. Just continue to be with us and let us and guide us and show us the way that we should go and walk that we should walk with you, Lord. And just want to praise you and give you all honor and glory and praise in Jesus' name and prayer. Amen. Now bear with me this morning. He says in verse 16, while Paul waited for them at Athens, his spirit was stirred within him. Why, Marie? When he saw the city wholly given to idolatry. Your spirit should be stirred up in you when you see all your kinfolk around here, what they're doing. They're serving the devil. There ought to be something within us as Christians that we want to say something to these people. You know, they grew up like they are. They grew up with their Santa Clauses and Easter bunnies and idol worship and money worship and clothes and homes and cars and these are all idols. Yeah, we need all these things, but do they have to be our idols? And so, Paul's spirit was stirred up in him. And he says in verse 23, God is moving in this man. And God is using this man. He says, for as I passed by, and I beheld your devotions. Look how these people act and pray and do, and yet they have no relationship with the Creator. Oh, I've been praying about this, and I've been hoping for this, and I know God said, that's what he says here. This is 2,000 years ago this is written, and people are acting like it's still today. Think about it. He says, I found an altar with this inscription to the unknown God, whom therefore you <coughs> ignorantly worship. <coughs> Him do I declare unto you. Think about it. Him. I want to talk to you about That's what he says. Now, contrary to those who insist that there is no such thing as a God, or God, no matter how primitive a group of people or a tribe of people, wherever we have gone throughout the world, the biggest part of the people worship someone or something. So everybody believes that there is a God. Before we end today, I'm going to show you about a woman who just does exactly what the prophet tells her to do, but she doesn't even believe in his God. And yet she's following his instructions. And so, like it or not, we believe in the existence of the supernatural. I believe in something well beyond human control. And I do not see how people can deny this. You look out into the stars at night, look into the heavens, and how did all these things happen? You get up in the morning and you walk outside. How did all this happen? Junior was telling me about his killer in there a while ago. Did that killer just happen to appear one day? Or did somebody have to make it? Did somebody have to build it? How can we possibly look at our whole earth that we have out there and think that it just happened? Come on, this lie that they're teaching you and our children in our schools is just that. It's a lie. Things just don't happen. And what they want to use, you know, They have their scientific knowledge, they say. But the Bible has something to say about that. Turn with me to Romans chapter 1, please. The Bible has something to say about you today. You're in church. And you know what God wants from you. But are you going to do what God wants you to do? Or are you going to do what you want to do? <coughs> He says in verse 19 of Romans chapter 1, 
because that which may be known of God is manifest in them, for God has showed it to them. For the invisible things of him, that means things that we can't see, from the creation of this world are clearly seen, being understood by the things that are made, even his eternal power and Godhead. So this morning, church, you are without excuse. You know God exists because you looked out and you've seen the stars and you know they couldn't just pop out there out of nothing. You've seen the trees growing. You've seen the grass out there. You've seen, if, if you will, Judy's killer. They didn't just pop out of nothing. There had to be some designer behind it all. There had to be some high design individual that made it all happen. It just didn't just appear, they did it. I mean, we all should know better than that, you know? And so we also know that there is a grand designer, a grand creator who created everything. Therefore, it must be admitted that the concept of unbelief, the concept of unbelief, to me, has a very hard... I just can't even consider not believing that there is a God. I just cannot consider even entering into the, 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 anything. Now, where did this podium come from? Where did the fans, where did everything that we have come from? If God didn't give us knowledge, then how did we come up with this stuff if we were cavemen at one point in time? We just learned. <coughs> Excuse me. I'm already... <laughs> You know, these years are working on me. I'll soon be 76 years old. <clears throat> I'm going downhill. I'm not getting better. I'm getting worse off. This body is slowly degenerating day by day. <clears throat> and before long, it'll get worse and worse until it finally kills me. How can they say that we evolved, we got better over time, when everything we look at gets worse and dies over time? Nothing gets better. Everything gets worse and worse. My dad was so aggravated that he couldn't do what he wanted to do. He didn't even want to live no more. He said, I can't go out to my building and work. I can't drive my car. He said, I ain't good for nothing. I can't do nothing. And he looked me right in the face. He said, I don't even care about living no more. Yeah. That's a sad thing for us to get to that point. We should be getting to the point I can't wait to get to see my Savior. This body is falling away. But inside I'm getting renewed day by day. He's drawing me closer to Him. And one day I'm going to join him. And so, how can anyone look at all the wonders of nature, all the universe? How can we even consider that there is no God? And yet, inside of us, we all have that certain, uh, there is a higher power. There is something there. But yet, we don't want to admit that it is God. Is that it? Our scientists, many of them, want us to believe that the great equalizer to it all is time. You know? Somehow it makes things that are impossible, time, become possible. If that were the case, I'd come along like getting better. <laughs> Why am I getting older then? Why? Why do people need doctors? Huh? If we're getting better, we should be healing ourselves and getting better and better and better, right? So there must be a God. Matthew chapter 15. I got an answer for these people that don't want to believe in God. I got an answer for these people that don't want to come to church. 
And it's in verse 14. Where are you going to read it? Matthew 15, verse 14. This is what Jesus says about it. Let them alone. They be blind leaders of the blind. And if the blind leave the blind, both shall fall into the ditch. And the ditch he's talking about is hell. If that's what they want, Jesus said, well, they can go to hell then. Just think about that. Do they realize how they're living their lives and what they want to do? And what are you doing about it this morning? Are you following along with them? Or are you fraternizing with them? Are you being their personal friend? Well, in many respects, the message that Paul was preaching there that we began with today, these people were educational people. They were what you would call intellectuals today. And they gathered in a place called Ario Scopus or something like that, also known as Mars Hill in Athens. Areopolis or Areogopolis. It's a hill west of Acropolis where the Athenian Supreme Tribunal and Court of Morals was held. And this is where Paul delivered this message in Acts 17, 23. As I passed by and I beheld your devotion. But what got him to deliver this message? You see? What gets me to preach the message? I can't, do, I, I, I can't do it on my own. Because where do the words come from? What do I preach about? Go back to verse 16. In Acts? Acts chapter 17, verse 16. Okay. While Paul waited on them, the rest of the disciples he was with, in Athens, what happened, Ruth? His spirit was stirred in him when he saw the city fully given to idolatry. Something has got to happen to us. You want these people to go to hell? Do you want to go to hell? Something has got to happen to us. Hey, you're on the road to Pine Grove, from Pine Grove into New Martinsville. Okay. What if there was a flood in New Martinsville and the river was coming down so fast you didn't even know the water was up. You come around that last turn before you hit the straightaway. Coming up on that red light it certified there. As soon as you come around that turn on that flat part all of a sudden there's nothing but water and it's 20 feet high and it's gushing. You've got to hit the brakes and you don't have time to hit the brakes. Because there it is so fast when you come around that truck. You wasn't expecting it. What's going to happen to you? What if somebody you had just passed had seen it and they're headed back? Wow, that, that guy's really in a hurry. wonder where he's going. He ain't blowed the horn. He ain't waved his hand. He ain't said nothing to you. He's just getting out here. Now what do you think of him? Well, that guy should have told us that all that mess was up here. That guy should have done this. That guy should have... Isn't that what you say to him? Why didn't you do this? What, what do you think your people are going to say to you when they get into hell? What are they going to say to me? You preached up there, Pastor. Why didn't you tell me the truth? Look, you have to lie to me. Just so I'd come to your church at least I would have a choice to make where I could make a decision. Do I want to go there or not? Something's going to have to stir up in us. We're going to have to do something. You know, verse 18 says he reasoned and argued. He said certain philosophers of Epicureans and the Stoics encountered him. And some said, what will this babbler say? And then other some. He seemeth to be a 
sent her forth a strange God, because he preached unto them Jesus and the resurrection. What are they saying about me out here? What are they saying I'm doing out here? I'm preaching Jesus. That's what I'm preaching. And all this other stuff is idols. And what do they want? They want their idols. And are you just going along with them? And you all that it's okay? <coughs> so they say, I guess they say I'm a bad one as well. And then a few others said, well, I seem to be an answer, an answer of foreign deities. Isn't that what they say about me? I'm saying stuff that's, that's foreign to them. Oh, a lot of our pastors tell us about Santa Claus and the Easter Bunny and Christmas and this all. What are you listening to? Fables? Jokes? What? Others said, what? Verse 19. And they took him. And they brought him to Aragopolis, saying, May we know what this new doctrine that you're speaking about is. I mean, can you tell us something about what you're preaching to us? Or are you just going to continue on babbling away where we don't know what's going on? My mouth don't seem to be working up here. And you know, I, I don't have a I don't have a problem with it because I know that the devil is out to do anything and everything he can do to stop us. He doesn't want us to He doesn't want us to learn anything. He doesn't want us to have anything. He doesn't want us to do anything. He wants us to be just like we've been asleep. He wants you to stay asleep, and then one day you're going to die. And you're going to wake up and lift up your eyes in hell. Verse 19 says, They brought him to Areopagus and saying, May we know what this new doctrine that you're speaking to us. You know, a, a new doctrine? God created the heavens and the earth. How could this be new? How come they don't know that? How come they don't know there ain't no Santa Claus or Easter Bunny? Do they know? Yes, they know. Do they want to admit it? No. They would rather have their idols. And they would rather you join them as they journey their place and whatever they're doing so they can get to hell. He says in verse 20, Thou bringest certain strange things to our ears. What do, you, what do these things mean? You know? You set forth these strange things. He says in verse 21, For all the Athenians he said, and, and strangers which were doing nothing but spending their time out there talking about some new thing. You know, talking about foreign matters. So verse 22, Paul says, stands up in the middle of them, and he says, you men of Athens, I perceive that in all things you are too superstitious. <laughs> you think your people are superstitious? What does he mean? Well, he's standing up, he says, I perceive in every way and on every hand and every turn that I make, it looks to me like you're very religious. Or should I say you're very reverent to many things, but you show me no reverence to the real God. Isn't that something? You are really reverent. You are really religious, but you're not religious with the real God. You're religious with something else. For as I passed by, verse 23, I found an altar with this inscription, 
to the unknown God whom you ignorantly worship. <laughs> Think about that. He said, I came upon this inscription to the unknown God. Then verse 24, he says, God that made the world, he produced all things that are in the world, and he is the Lord of heaven and earth, but see, he doesn't dwell in tents or tabernacles or in things of Man has built with his hands. Now look at what your life is doing. Look at look in your life what you're doing. Are you reverencing the God in heaven or all these material things on this earth? Your land, your home, your car, people, groceries, money. Where's God at in your life? Is he number one in your life? Because if he's not number one, then he's nothing. He's just another God, then, isn't he? He's the unknown God. He's your unknown God. <coughs> you can't wash him with your hands. That's what he says in verse 25. He's neither worship with man's hands, though he needed anything. Seeing he, he gives us all of us life and breath and all things. So he gives everything to us and what do we give back? What do we do for him? We buy ourselves clothes? You remember what they do on Christmas? They buy each other gifts. What do they do for the Lord? They don't even bother what to come to his church. That's what they do. Oh, we can't come to church today. It's Christmas. To the unknown God. That's who I'm preaching this morning. The unknown God. Right here in Pine Grove, West Virginia. He is the unknown God. Yeah, they ignorantly worship him. But he's just another one of their idols. They worship him like he's another idol. Not like he is God. He said in verse 27, They should seek the Lord, and happily they might feel after him, and find him, though he be not far from every one of us. And so, he says in verse 28, For in him we live and move and have our being. He said, As certain also of your own prophets have said, For we are also the offspring, or his offspring. And so, are you God's offspring? You didn't just come about out of nothing. You had to come from somewhere. And we were made in the image of our Creator. That's what the Bible tells us. He created man in his own image. Created he them, male and female. He created us in his own image. To do what? To worship idols? To give our lives to idols? To be idol worshippers? I got there on the sign. It's been out there for probably three or four years now. Learn not the way of the heathen. And don't be dismayed at the signs of heaven. For the heathen are dismayed at him. He cuts a tree out of the forest to work, to work them with the hands. And he brings it into his home and he decks it with gold and silver. They said, he's not talking about a Christmas tree there. He's talking about an idol. Bingo. Isn't that what Christmas trees are? Idols? Huh? Isn't that what he's talking about? Then he's really talking about idols. That people are worshiping today. They're also worshiping the unknown God. When I went in Walmart, I heard a song during the Christmas thing, the few times that I went in around that holiday. Oh, Christmas tree, oh, Christmas tree. Yeah, they were singing songs to a tree. And the thing about it, they already know that tree's dead because it's been cut down. That's how they got it in their house. They had to cut it down, so how could it do anything for them? 
The Bible says it cannot move, it cannot think, it cannot walk, it cannot do anything, and yet you worship it. Huh? Bow down. Definitely bow down to them, because I guarantee you right now there's people paying back bills they paid at Christmas to buy somebody something. So they would get something in return, of course, but anyway. Then he says in verse 29, For as much then as we are the offspring of God, we ought not to think that the Godhead is like gold or silver or stone or graven. He's talking about these things you put on a Christmas tree. Yeah, gold and silver and all this. What's verse 30 saying, Marie? And the times of this ignorance God winked at, but now commanded all men everywhere to repent. You think you can get by with God and keep doing this? You think that if you think everything's going to just be okay? It might appear that in former times or former ages that your ignorance of God, who is true, but yet people are ignorant and they are ignoring him. But you know what God did? He has given us this great conviction. And he has given us this assurance. He's given us this evidence by raising Jesus from the dead. You'll never get that Christmas tree to take root once you cut it down and set it in your house for a couple of weeks. Take it back out there and stick it in the ground and see how long, what it'll do. You know, he's fixed a day when he's going to judge the world righteously and justly. And he's going to do this by the man whom he has appointed for that task. And the man that he appointed for that task, he raised him from the dead. And his name is Jesus. He's going to judge you at that last day. Have you heard Jesus in your heart? Have you heard about Jesus in your life? The Athens, pretty much like the people here in Pine Grove, have worshipped numerous gods and goddesses, in their temples even. In Athens they called it a pantheon. I guess that's an Athenian way of saying a, a temple of many gods, a pantheon. But in this pantheon they also had an altar erected. <laughs> if there was any god they might have left out. They had this altar erected to the unknown God. If we left you out, we, we didn't mean to. But we want to worship everybody and everything. And what do people do around Christmas then? Some of them will come and put on all their new clothes and stuff, huh? Because we don't want to leave out Him, the unknown God, right? What about Easter? They get all decked out in their new Easter outfit, and what do they do? Go to church on Easter morning? Why? Because they don't want to do nothing against that unknown God and do that. For the rest of the year, they don't have anything to do with him. They got their other gods for the rest of the year. <laughs> Isn't that awesome? So what's the outcome? Well, think about it. Some of the people, is it just like it is today? Verse 32. And when they heard of the resurrection of the dead, some mocked, and others said, We will hear thee again of this matter. So some of them mocked him. We got people right here in Pine Grove doing that to us right now, don't they? They're mocking us because we're coming to church. But then again, there are some who believe. Because they said, We want to hear some more about this later. Not right now, but later. We gotta digest what we've already heard. We gotta go home and think about it. And what they're meaning to say is, 
We're open if God is willing to show himself to us. We're willing to hear what God has to say. You know? So when they had heard about the resurrection from the dead, I said, we're going to hear you again on this matter. So, verse 35, or 33, Paul says, he just left them. Just walked away from them. Verse 34, though. Read that, please. Howbeit certain men clave unto him and believed, among the which was Dionysius the Aragat, and a woman named Demarius, and others with them. You see, some people believe that, and when we're talking about some of these people here, these were knowledgeable people. These were people that knew a little something. They wasn't like us, you know, running the middle poor people. <laughs> they was intelligent. They were learned people. Some of them. Look around today in your families and such. And we're going to hear, we'll talk about us coming to church another time. Is that what it is? Yeah. I'll be back to that and we talk with a woman at Walmart. She said, you just watch and see. One of these days you're going to see me back in that church. That was what, last year? I've been watching my head. <laughs> <laughs> the last year, the year before, must have came invisible because I haven't seen this individual. And so, what's the difference today? They say, I'm not going to that church because, and they give you this lame excuse why they're not coming to church. But when they give you this lame excuse about not coming to this church because that pastor's a hypocrite, or that pastor don't know what he's talking about, or that pastor's against the American way, he don't want Christmas and Santa Claus and Easter. <laughs> that man is crazy. I'm going to ask him then, what church did you decide to go to then? Well, I'm still looking. <laughs> yeah. Oh, I haven't gone to any yet. Oh, really? You just have some bad things to say about this church. But you haven't gone to any other church to see if this one was as bad as what you're saying. You haven't gone nowhere to compare it with and have you? Think about it. And while we're not being totally specific on people like Demarius and others who believe, I believe some of these people were just common folks like us. They believed in the Lord Jesus Christ and they became saved. Just like us. The same way we can do. But what about the ones that don't believe? You see, how in this world can you not believe there is a God? And if you do believe that there is a God, how can you live your life and say, I don't want nothing to do with Him? <laughs> you see the irony in this? I mean, it stirs me up to no end. When I think about it, it just stirs me up. You say you believe in God. But what are you doing about it? Do you care that He lived? Do you care that He died on the cross for you? Turn with me to the book of 1 Corinthians. Paul makes it clear that mankind's response to the gospel that we're looking at is kind of disproportionate. Because he says in verse 23 of 1 Corinthians, chapter 1, look what he says. We preach Christ crucified unto the Jews a stumbling block and unto the Greek foolishness. Now what is he saying? Well, this preaching, when the Jews hear about it, it causes like a scandal because it's an offense to them. Because he's a man who claims to be God. And anyone that did that, as far as the Jews are concerned, is blaspheming God. And so he becomes a stumbling block to them. But then... It's kind of like a snare or a trap 
because they got their religion and they get caught up in their religion and it's like a mouse trap that got a hold of them midway to their body and they can they can see around they can move their hands and they can think and they can do but they just can't move from where they're at it's kind of like people that we know they're in a trap they're believing they're saying that there is a God, but they're in this trap, aren't they? What can I do about this? And so, we look at the Gentiles, or the Greek, and they look at it as absurd, utterly nonsense. Here's the man that was crucified. And you're going to tell me this man that they let be crucified was God's only son. That's absurd. That's crazy. Why would God do such a thing? You know God would never do this. And what are they looking at? They're looking at their own self. Because they're saying to themselves, I'm too proud. I wouldn't let nobody do that to me or my son. I'd do something about it. And if there was any kind of a God, he'd do something about it too. So they think it's stupid. Ridiculous. Crazy. But verse 24, Marie. But in two of them which are called, both Jews and Greeks, Christ the power of God and the wisdom of God. And see, so whether they're Jew or Greek or Gentile or whatever, Christ is the power of God and the wisdom of God. Because, verse 25 says, the foolishness of God is wiser than men. And the weakness of God, I don't know if God could have foolishness or weakness. But I'm just saying if he did, I think that's what Paul's trying to get across. Because God is not weak. And he's not foolish. You know, but the very thing, the very thing that comes from God is totally against what people think. Because this is foolishness. How can this be? And so, this is the power of God. Then he can take something that you think is crazy, that's foolishness, and use it to save us. <laughs> and then he said in verse 26, For you see your calling, brethren, how that not many wise men after the flesh, not many noble, not many are called, and not many mighty. Think about that. And so, here at Athens, where Paul was preaching, he got better than what the average would be. Because there was a few noblemen there. There was a few mighty people there. One of them was a, a governor. One of them was a, a, a ruler uh, of such. And so, when we look at what God has done, did you believe in Jesus? This morning, ask yourself that. Do you really believe in Jesus? Then look at that. If you believe in Jesus, bear with me now here as we go through this, God deliberately selected us and chose us. Why would God choose you? What have you got to give Him? You see? You look at some people that's got money and education. What would God have to do with you? You're a, you're a vagrant. You don't have no money. You live in a dump. You drive a piece of junk for a car. You don't have a dollar to rub against a dollar. Why would God want you? This is exactly why God shows you. You see? To confound the wisdom of the wise. It says in verse 27, that God cho has chosen the foolish things of the world to confound the wise. He's chosen the weak things of the world to confound the things that are mighty. And why? Verse 28, Marie. And base things of the world, and things which are despised, hath God chosen. Yea, and things which are not, to bring to naught things that are. So what I can tell you this morning, God deliberately selected and even chose what the world has despised. God deliberately selected and chose you because he sent his Son Jesus here to save you. And God put it in your heart that you wanted to be saved. 
And why did God do this? So that no flesh could glory in his presence. He called you with a holy calling. He says in verse 30, But of him are you in Christ Jesus, who of God is made unto us wisdom and righteousness, sanctification and redemption. And so we don't have to have all this stuff. Jesus already has it. And he's given it to us if we'll but believe on him. Believe on him. And you can have all these things that God has given us. Verse 31 says that according as it is written, he that glorieth, let him glory in the Lord. And so then as it is written, are you going to listen to what the Bible says? Or are you going to listen to what your kinfolk tell you? Why do you suppose God chose the weak things and the base things of this life? Why do you suppose that when you don't hear God and you end up staying out of church and you start getting all these sicknesses and diseases coming on you, what do you suppose? That just was going to happen? You think that's the deal? Or do you think maybe... Maybe that God selected you and God chose you. And he wants to make you understand, hey, I'm up here. I can help you. But you're going to have to call me. You're going to have to let go of this other stuff because I'm the only thing in this life you need. I'm all you need. I am everything you need. You need food. I'll provide it. You need clothing? I'll provide it. You need money? I'll provide it. That no man can glory in his presence and say, I did this. I don't need God. I did this. I remember in my sign shop down in Houston, Texas, before all hell broke loose, two men came in my shop one day and they wanted to look around in the shop and see how I was manufacturing and stuff. So I took them on a tour back in my shop. Guys were working all over. And uh, they started asking me a few questions. And how did I get what I had? I said, I got everything in here that I have by the seat of my pants. I worked my butt off to get to where I'm at. He says, God didn't help you get this? And I said, you know what? If there is such a thing as a God, he's somewhere out there, and he sure ain't done nothing for me. I did what I have all by myself. I turned around to say something to one of my employees, and when I turned back, they were gone. And I went up to the front, and Marie had her office. My office was here, Marie's was here, and the reception area, and Ethel was sitting there. I said, where did the men go? Did you see the men leave here or what? I said, ain't nobody been up here. I've been here by myself. Nobody been here since you took them two guys back there in the back. And there was no other way out of that shop. They had to go through there, and it just disappeared. And you can believe God or you could not believe God. But that's when my son business fell apart. Because I didn't give God the glory. You know, no mortal man is going to stand in God's presence and say, I did this, or I did that. God wants us all to know. So he brings down one kingdom and he sets up another kingdom. You know, the distribution of those who are saved from among the groups, I think the emphasis is on the poor. And God had to make me poor in order to save me. God had to take everything that I had away from me. He couldn't save me in the condition that I was in because I was all about, I did it. I was Mr. Pride, if you want to talk about pride, I was that. I didn't fit into God's eternal plan. So God had to get me to a point that I did. 
Now maybe you're at a point today. You know that there was a God. And that God is who he says he is. You know that. But you haven't been doing the right thing with him. So maybe he's dealing with you the same way he dealt with me. He took everything I had. And I had to be flat on my back looking up before I could understand that he was who he said he was. You know, we're sure to know that God is a partner in all of our labor, in all the things. And we have to fit into his plan, you know. He's made good things for all of us. But when we don't take the time to say, Lord, you're God. You're the creator. I'm just a man. I've done nothing. And by myself. Romans chapter 8, please. I think this fits right in, in place here. Because this third in my spirit, these verses, as I was going through this message last night. For what the law, verse 3, for what the law could not do in that it was weak through the flesh, God sending his own Son in the likeness of sinful flesh, and for sin, condemned sin in the flesh, that the righteousness of the law might be fulfilled in us, who walk not after the flesh, but after the Spirit. Verse 5, For they are after the flesh who do mind the things of the flesh, but they that are after the Spirit, the things of the Spirit. So think about what you're doing. Do you want to walk in the flesh or do you want to walk in the Spirit? If you don't walk in the Spirit, how are you going to please God? You see, we got to take our eyes off of the world and we got to realize there is a God. And we are spirit beings. We're in a flesh body, but we're spirit beings as well. Are we living like we are a spirit being? You know? Verse 8. What does verse 8 say, Marie? So then they that are in the flesh cannot please God. <laughs> and so you can come to church till the towns come home. But if you're not in the spirit here this morning, how are you ever going to please God? Because the Bible says you can't do it. Now drop down to verse 27 with me. Look what he says here. Read it, Marie. Okay. And he that searches the heart knoweth what is the mind is the mind of the spirit, because he maketh intercession for the saints according to the will of God. So he knows. He knows what's in your mind, in your spirit's mind. He knows. Are you doing what God wants you to be doing? Are you doing it your way? Are you in the flesh this morning or are you in the spirit? Sometimes when you come to church, we ought to at least get into the spirit while we're in church, if nothing else, you know. We ought to spend some time with God in the spirit while we're in church. If we don't, we want to know, at least we ought to do it here. And he said in verse 28, And we know that all things work together for good to them that love God, to them that are called according to His purpose. Now, all things work together for good. You mean to tell me, me going to prison for 14 years made things good? I would have died and went to hell if I hadn't. Huh? What about putting sickness or disease on you? Maybe you would have died and gone to hell in your unbelief if God didn't put you up on you to draw you closer to Him. Think about what we're doing and what we're, what's happening right now. This is a time to take a reflection of our lives. The Bible has something to say about God's call on us. In 2 Timothy chapter 1 and verse 9, he says, Who has saved us and called us with a holy calling, not according to our works, but according to his own purpose and grace, 
which was given us in Christ Jesus before the world began. When you think about that now, that's a lot. God selected you before the world began. Are you going to go against what God selected and say, no, I'm not going to take your eternal purpose for me. I'm going to go to hell because that's what I want. Is that what you're going to say? He was delivered and has saved us to live a life of holiness. In Titus chapter 3, verse 5, he says, Not by works of righteousness which we have done, but by according to his mercy he saved us, by the washing of regeneration and renewing of the Holy Ghost. He did not because of anything of merit that we had done. He didn't do it because something we did was so great. He did it for his own self. Ephesians chapter 1, verse uh, chapter 4, verse 1, yeah, chapter 1, verse 4. I'm getting ahead of myself here this morning. According as he has chosen us in him before the foundation of the world, that we should be holy and without blame before him in love. You see, he chose us. It wasn't us who chose him. He chose us. Now, what are you doing with him choosing you? Are you saying, yes, Lord? Or are you saying, no, Lord, I'm going to have it my way? If you're saying, no, Lord, I'm going to have it my way, then aren't you on a rocky road like I was? Hmm? You're on a rocky road just like I was. Why? <laughs> because you're in deep trouble with God. And God's going to try to fix that. You see, i got this thing. I think God has the same feelings that I have. If it ain't broke, don't fix it. You know? I don't, I don't, I don't fix it if it ain't broke. And I don't think God's going to try to fix us if it ain't broke. So if you've got something wrong with you, you need fixing it, don't you? Huh? If you've got something wrong with you, Hank, you need fixing it, don't you? Think about that. So you must be broke. Now how does God fix it? Okay, well let's see. What does glue taste like? I'm not going to eat no God's not going to glue you together then, is he? How's God going to fix it? Oh, well, first off, he's probably got to make an incision, and then he's got to cut it there, you know, and then after he cuts it, he takes the bad part out, then he's got to stick it back together. Hey, can you imagine what that feels like if he cut your across the middle and laid half of you over here and half of you over there, then he picked the two halves of you up and stuck you up here, he took a big needle and you're watching him and he sews you back together. What is it going to be like then when we have things happen to us? We're broken and we need fixed and he's the fixer. He shows us. Think about that. Now as I said a while ago, even in his love, he picked us out for himself as his own in Christ Jesus. He done it before the foundation of the world. He wanted us to be holy and blameless in his sight. But you know, a lot of people, they go to church or call him Jesus Lord. You know that? There's a lot of church people calling Jesus Lord. Turn with me in Matthew chapter 7, verse 21. But what does he say about all these people calling him Lord? You come to church and you call him Lord, but what does he say about it, Marie? 721. Not everyone that says unto me, Lord, Lord, shall enter into the kingdom of heaven, but he that does the will of my Father, which is in heaven. Think about that. Just because you say he's Lord, does that get you into heaven? No. <laughs> but what, then, what do you have to do? You have to do the will of the Father. Isn't that what he says? Yes. And what is the will of the Father? Many will say to me in that day, verse 22, Lord, Lord, have we not prophesied in your name, preached in your name? He's talking about preachers here. They preached in the name of Jesus. And in your name we cast out demons. Devils, demons, throw them out of there. In your name we've done all these wonderful works. 
What's he say in verse 23? And then when I profess unto them, I never knew you. Depart from me, you that work in equity. Wait a minute. That was the preacher talking there to start with. Did he tell the preacher to get away from him? Because he's a sinner? Come on now. Where do we stand here this morning? Are we going to do the will of the Father? Are we going to do our will? <laughs> did you want to hear him say, depart from me? No. You wicked. Is that what you want to hear him say to you? You wicked. Say, get away from me, you wicked. You know, John chapter 6, verse 44. I like this part here. Now think about it. Because... Oh, I got saved, and I did this, and I did that. How did you get saved? Huh? How did you, how did you decide you wanted to come to church, Star? Hank, Judy, whoever. How did you decide to make up your mind you were coming to church? Read the verse, please. No man can come to me except the Father which has sent me draw him, and I will raise him up at the last day. God the Father is the one who has asked you and drove on you to church this morning. You came here by God Himself. God ordained you to be here and brought you here this morning. Amen. Because He wants you to be saved. Amen. Now what are you doing with my God? He drove you and He brought you here so you can lean on His Son Jesus. No one can come to me unless he draws us, he says. This verse tells us that we have to be drawn by God. Or we can't be saved. You see, we have people that come to church. And they'll stand in their pulpit and all you hear is I, 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 I stuff. Did God draw them? Or did they come on their own? They think so they can talk about us. Exactly. We need to think about why we're here. Did God hold you to church this morning? Think about it now. People wandered all over the place today. They're desperately searching for something. But they don't have a clue about what it is. <laughs> it seems like they got some itches they can't scratch, you know. Some even probably said I could just I could just buy me some fireworks yesterday. Then I did maybe that would make me happy. But then they blowed up all their fireworks and there they were standing and they were still unhappy. Maybe they thought, well, I'll buy me a good old soda bottle. That'll make me happy. But will it satisfy you for very long until you want another one? Think about it. What if you filled up your belly with water? You drank, blah, 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 and you just filled yourself up. You couldn't take another ounce of nothing into your belly because you were so full of water. And here comes somebody by with a big old steak. You want this steak? And it's got potatoes and mashed gravy and beans and all the stuff that you really like on this big tray. Here, you want to eat this? You've got to eat it now within the next five minutes or you can't have it. Wait a minute. I, I just filled up on water. I don't have a room for another ounce to get in me. What are you going to feel about that? You see, what are we filling up with? If we're filling up with the world, it ain't going to be long before we get hungry because that water's going to pass through you pretty quick. But if you had a waiting and you ate that steak, and your belly's going to be full for a good while, isn't it? You're not going to get hungry as fast, then, are you? Matthew chapter 5. I, I said all that to show you this verse. Verse 6. Jesus is preaching on the mount here. He says, Blessed are they which do hunger and thirst after righteousness, for they shall be filled. You see, he's going to give you that steak. He ain't going to fill you up with water. He's going to give you that steak. You know? You're not going to be hungry and thirsty. You're not going to have an itch you can't scratch. He's going to give you what you're looking for. That's why when people go out, they buy a new car, and on the way home, they're looking at other cars. That scratch was never fixed. They still got that itch. They want something else. 
And that is, is, is the Lord. You're missing the Lord in your life. You know? Turn to the first Kings, chapter 17. There's a story over here about Elijah and his widow woman. Now, I promised you when I started this morning that I was going to tell you about this woman and this prophet. 1 Kings 17, verse 24. And the woman said to Elijah, Now by this I know that thou art a man of God, and that the word of the Lord is in thy mouth is true. Now, this I know that you're a man of God, and God's word is in your mouth. God made this woman a believer, didn't he? Because from the way she's talking, she didn't believe who he was to begin with, and did she? Because she says, now this I know that you're a man of God. And so, God's going to give us a learning lesson out of a little bit of flour and a jar of oil. You know? Now, I realize you're talking about flour and oil and stuff right here before lunchtime. It's going to make you hungry. But I hope I make you spiritually hungry and not just physically hungry. I want to ask you, do you have financial problems today. How about relationship problems? Are you having trouble with people in your life? Or how about do you need a fresh encounter with the Lord today? Well, Jesus said, I am the bread of life. He said, he who comes to me shall never hunger, and he who believes in me shall never thirst. Do you believe that this morning? Well, in 1 Kings here, chapter 17, and verse 7, it says, It came to pass, after a while, that the brook dried up. And what's he talking about? Well, there was a drought in the land, and Elijah declared that there wasn't going to be a drop of water come from God during the time that he was going to be out there preaching. Three and a half years. And so the drought is edging on. And he sent Elijah to live by the brook Hebron. And he says, while you're there, I'm going to let you drink the water out of the brook, and I'm going to send you ravens to bring your food to eat in the morning and in the evening. Roadkill. <laughs> what do ravens get? Crows. What do you see the crows get? Out there alongside the highway, picking up the dead stuff. They bring it to Elijah to eat. And he gets to drink the water. But then know what happens? The brook dried up. It's time for you to move on, Elijah. I need something for you to do. And so, verse 8, the word of the Lord came to him, saying, Arise, get thee to Zarephath, which belongeth to Zidon, and dwell there. Behold, I have commanded a widow woman there to sustain thee. Oh, why? So he said, well, I get to go down to this uh, place down here uh, at Zarephath and uh, I get to see this widow woman down there so I'm not only not going to be by myself I'm going to have me a, I'm going to have me a woman and she's going to take care of me so here he goes trotting off down to see this woman where the Lord sent him to go right now Zarephath is a suburb of the capital city where Jezebel's father was the king at the time. Okay? <laughs> and so it was pretty corrupt in that land at the time. Now some people say down in that neck of the woods that she was gone, there wasn't nothing but black folks lived down there. But I don't know. It doesn't make any difference to God, so it shouldn't make any difference to us, even if it was so. And so now, when the brook had run dry, Elijah had to leave there and, and go down. So in verse 10, he rose and he went to Zarephath. When he came to the gate of the city, <coughs> behold, the widow woman was there gathering of sticks. And he called her and said, Fetch me, I pray thee, a little water in a vessel that I may drink. Now, can you, can you picture this? Here comes this scrubby old prophet. He's been out there all by himself. Living along a brook, he didn't, didn't say he had a cave to live in, didn't have a house to live in, probably smelled like a herd of goats, you know, and here he comes, ain't had a shave or a haircut, Lord only knows when, 
And he comes rolling into town and he sees this woman over there picking up sticks working. He said, hey woman, how about fetch me a drink of water? And what does she say? Hmm? Verse 11, she was going to fetch it. And he called her. She's on her way to get him some water. Stop at what she's doing to go get him some water. He called her and said, bring me, I pray thee, a morsel of bread in thine hand. Now he only, not only wants a drink of water, he wants something to eat. <laughs> now, just imagine this picture. <laughs> and you're this woman, a widow woman at that. Her husband's dead. And then she, she's out there doing more than only knows what just to live. And she said, verse 12, As the Lord thy God liveth, thy God, not my God, but your God. So she recognized him as a, a Jew. I guess, or prophet maybe. She says it's talking about his God, not her God. As thy God liveth, I have not a cake, but a handful of meal in a barrel, and a little oil in a cruise. And behold, I am gathering two sticks, that I may go in and dress it for me and my son, that we may eat it and die. This is all we got to eat. As soon as we eat that, there ain't going to be nothing else, and now we're going to die of starvation. Elijah said to her, Now hold on a minute, listen to what y'all doing, because some people are so concerned about their money. If I get to church any money, then I won't have none for me. If I do this, then I won't have that for myself. I'm not going to do all that craziness. Listen to what happened, verse 13. Elijah said, Fear not, do as, as thou said, but make me thereof a little cake first, and bring it unto me. And they go back and make for you and your son. Now she said she only had enough to make one. And what does he say? Give me that one. And once you've given it to me, then I want you to go back and make you one. And she probably scratching her head. <laughs> if I give him all that I have, there ain't going to be nothing left for me. And if she didn't do it, then there wouldn't have been, would there? But what happened? Verse 14. Thus saith the Lord God of Israel, Woo! Now she knows who he is. Thus saith the Lord God of Israel. Verse 14. The barrel of meal shall not waste, neither shall the cruise of oil fail until the day that the Lord sendeth rain upon the earth. And so I'm sure that this woman didn't have no big thing to keep her flower in. Probably some little canister like we see in our homes today. Something small. And the cruise of oil, probably a little thing of oil, no bigger than that. That they had to go every day to get it replenished, wherever. And so, verse 15, she went and did according to the saying of Elijah, and she and her house did eat many days. How did they eat many days if there was only enough for her and her son to have one meal? Because they did what God said to do. They come to God first. She put her hands in God. So God tested her willingness and her obedience. Just as he does with us from time to time. He tests you to see what you're going to do. Are you going to pass the test or are you going to keep failing? If you keep failing, if you keep missing out on the things that God has for you. She told Elijah she only had enough for her and her son to eat one last meal before starvation. Most of us would have said something to him that wasn't nice when he asked for the last meal. Probably. Scrubby old man, get out of here. You ain't getting my last piece of bread. What do you think I am, crazy? But as surely as the Lord your God lives, she knew that our God was a living God, but he was not her God. God is using this woman, and she doesn't even know he's God. That's what I was talking about this morning. God has called you, and you didn't even know it when he called you. You wasn't searching for God. You wasn't looking for God in any way. So what happened? Verse 15. She went and did according to the saying of Elijah. 
she and her house did eat many days. And the barrel of meal wasted not, verse 16, neither did the cruise of oil fail, according to the word of the Lord by the prophet Elijah. You know, I'm sure that every time she set that jar of oil down, it looked like it was empty. And I'm sure every time she went over to that flower bin, it looked like there was only enough for one more cake in it. But every time she poured it out and set it down, there was another one left in it. Meaning that God is going to supply your needs every day. He wants you to come to Him every day. The Bible says, Thou shalt not live by bread alone, but by every word that proceeded out of the mouth of God. God wants you to come to Him every day. He wants you to talk to Him every day. You know, because our faith is not what we would call a one-time commitment, but our faith is kind of like progressive. Our faith should grow day by day. We should get better and better, not worse and worse. We should be better and better. Elijah and his widow woman did not respond with faith just once and receive a warehouse full of flour and oil, but they had to respond every day by faith that God was going to provide their needs. Verse 17 there says, It came to pass after these things that the son of the woman, the mistress of the house, fell sick, and his sickness was so sore that there was no breath left in him. You know, it's bad enough you get sick around here. Now he's dying. Matter of fact, he must be dead because there's no breath left in him. Verse 18, She said unto Elijah, What have I to do with thee, O man of God? Art thou come unto me to call my sin to remembrance and to slay my son? You see there? She knew she was bad. That's the first thing about getting saved. You've got to recognize you're a sinner. You've got to realize what's in, that you've been bad. You know? And how you come. You put this sickness on me because of my sin. Have you put this mess on me because of the things I've done bad? <clears throat> Verse 19. He said to her, Give me thy son. He took him out of her bosom and carried him into a loft where he abode and laid him on his own bed. <coughs> Verse 20, he cried unto the Lord and said, O Lord my God, hast thou also brought evil upon the widow with whom I sojourned by slaying her son? Now today, they would have locked this man up for a child molester. Because look what he does. Verse 21, he stretched himself upon the child three times and cried unto the Lord, saying, O Lord my God, I pray thee, let this child's soul come into him again. And the Lord heard the voice of Elijah, and the soul of the child came into him again, and he revived. And he took the child to his mother, and said, Here, you see, he still lives. You know, we don't know how long that Elijah continued in this, but we know it wasn't past the three and a half years. But it may have been months long that they went through this mess that they had to go through. This widow woman, when times got bad, think about yourself. God, are you putting this sickness on me because of something I did that I shouldn't have done? Think about that. Aren't you saying the same thing today? Huh? When are you going to learn how to trust in the Lord with all your heart then? He'll take it away from you. Don't we believe? Jesus said all things are possible if you believe. You know? We should pray with such an awareness of the word of the Lord that our prayers are built on God's promises. Lord, you said. Lord, you promised. It's not the pastor that prays for you to get your prayers answered. He prayed for this boy because this boy was dead. 
I prayed for Hank because he was dead and he couldn't help himself. And God heard our prayer. Now God expects Hank to pray in honesty. He expects you to pray out of your heart. Not out of your wants, out of your heart. You know, it's hard to do when we look at death. You look at death as being so final. And we look at that and say, well, I can't beat death. You look at the sickness you might have and you say, I can't beat this sickness. No, you never could. But I got one thing to say, there's power in the blood. There's power in the blood. There's wonder working power in the blood of the Lamb. Okay, Jesus is the one. Get yourself out of the picture. It's Jesus. He's the one that's going to do the healing. He's the one that's going to make you right. So finally, this woman, we see her confession. After after he raises her son from the dead, forget about all the, every day, supplying her with flour and oil so they can have something to eat. All in days, and then the son dies. And after the son is brought back to life, what she say, verse 24, Marie? And the woman said to Elijah, now by this I know that thou art the man of God, and that the word of the Lord in thy mouth is true. So you see, she considered the truth. You can trust in the Lord yourself this morning. Consider what God has told you this morning here in this church. You can trust the Lord all the way up until you are dead. And somebody else is going to have to do the trusting for you. Mm, think about that. We don't live by bread alone. We live by every word that comes out of the mouth of God. And so if you're just seeking for something that you're going to have to eat today, or your next drink of soda pop, or your next candy bar, or whatever it is that you're thinking about, then get on to thinking about something else. How am I doing with God? I know that He heals. And it's not about will He heal me, or will He do this for me, or will He do that for me. Yes, the answer to all the questions are yes and amen. But more so, where is your faith? Have faith in God this morning. You know? And you will receive this gift of life, eternal. Forgiveness of sins, eternally. Don't seek to satisfy with longing in your flesh. Trust in the Lord with all of your heart. Now think about that this morning. When you go home this afternoon, and you go about doing something, let something be stirred up in your spirit when you see how your relatives are living. Something's got to happen to you. There's got to be a change in you. You've got to start feeling like, hey, something I can do about it. I can pray. Grab a hold of that person's hand and say, hey, let me pray with you. I know you've got this and you think i got that, but it's only a sentence that the devil put on me and God's let me be there until I grow in faith. And help me grow in faith. Help me as I pray for you and I grow in faith. Faith comes by hearing and hearing comes by the word of God even if the hearing comes from your own lips. Think about that now. The hearing comes by God. Well, we're going to have an offer call now. I've done been up here for an hour and 19 minutes. Boy, I'll tell you what. morning. He says in verse 16, while Paul waited for them at Athens, 